And welcome back. This is going to be the sixth part in the Fundamentals of 3D Modeling for Games, The Car. In this uh, chapter, we're going to be taking a look at un the Unreal Engine as a means of rendering our vehicle. Here, we'll be bringing our mesh into the engine. We'll be importing our textures into the engine. And we'll be creating materials in order to place them on our mesh. We'll place our mesh in the middle of the world and we will record a video of the entire process. Uh, sorry, not of the entire process. We'll be recording a video of the um, car spinning around. And so we'll, we'll create a turntable style resolution, uh, a turntable style render. So first thing that I wanna do here, I have the under open, is uh, import my car. So I got the content browser down here, and I'm just going to go and uh, create a new folder first and foremost. I like to keep things very organized when I'm in here. So I'm going to create a new folder first, which I'll call Meshes. I'll create another folder, which I'll name Textures. And I'll create a third folder, which I'll call Materials. Um, I generally like to keep working in this way so that if I have multiple textures used in multiple materials or in multiple different scenes they uh, they're all stored in the same folder and the same goes with materials and then finally the meshes I keep all in a single folder as well so I'm going to enter the meshes folder and I'm going to go ahead and import our car that we've gone and done so I'll go and find my projects and stylized car um, I'm going to go into my Let's see, where did I put you? And assets and the carlo.fbx. When I import here, one of the things that I just want to make sure is that this is not going to break my mesh up into chunks. So combine meshes here. I'll uh, turn that on and I'll say import. Now all of those underscore low and underscore high settings that we did, um, those are going to get broken. Now I did get an error here. Uh, on import telling me that my smoothing groups did not come into the engine and I'm just gonna go take a look and see that my car is rendering the way that I'd like it to and it does appear, appear to look like my vehicle uh, looks like I've got a missing polygon over here in the back uh, which appears to be a little bit of an error so I'll have to go and double check that You'll notice that the uh, car also inherited the uh, the materials that were set on the FBX, and not only were they imported here, but the um, the engine created a material. This was in the import settings that I had this ticked, and it created a material for each of the material IDs assigned to the vehicle, uh, including the names, which again improperly named this one. This should be called Chrome. Now, I don't need all of these materials here, and in fact, I'm going to go and delete these things. Um, we're going to do this in a much more efficient way than having all of these materials that were generated in Substance Painter. We're going to use instancing here to kind of speed things up in the engine a little bit. I do want to double check what's going on with that, uh, with that mesh, with that hole that's in there. And so I'm going to go and open Maya. And uh, we'll go take a look and see about that missing hole in the back of my car here. Uh, I can see it pretty pr pretty clearly here. And so this might just be the, uh, the results of something having been missed or uh, maybe hitting delete while I had polygon selected in Maya. So we're going to go take a look at that in Maya. While I'm doing that, while Maya is loading... I'll use the time here to go and import my textures as well. So I went and stored, the, sort of stored these inside of the textures folder. And here they are here. So I'm just going to grab all of those and import them. Now Unreal 4 will detect on import the normal maps. And we'll get a little warning here. Letting us know that the textures that are normals were imported as normals. Now what the engine is doing when you see this is it is changing the compression algorithm so that it uses one that's a little bit more friendly to normal maps. And the uh, images that are not normal maps are going to compress in a slightly different way. This ensures that we have a little less artifacting in our normal maps and they look as clean as can be. 
So I'm going to let this go. There's one more thing we need to do with these textures here um, as I kind of import them here. And that has to do with these merged images or these packed images that are the result of having been um, combined in Substance Painter. These by default are not going to render correctly inside of Unreal. And the reason for this, and I'm just going to open the editor here by double clicking on one of these images. The reason that these don't render correctly is the compression that's on here is using the sRGB value. Now, what this does is it means that it compresses an image. And again, this is a merge of three different images. We have something in the red channel, something in the green channel, something in the blue channel. So I'm going to turn off the sRGB. We'll give the engine a second to process this. And now that that's off, I can actually go and close this. And I'm going to have to do that for all of these really brightly imaged or brightly colored images here. This is just going to ensure that we get the right values that we saw in Substance Painter once we are in the engine. So that's three of four. And then finally, the last one here, which I'll turn off as well. Okay, so Maya has had sufficient time to load. And so I'm just going to go file and import and we'll go and check out our car to see what the uh, what the deal is here. So I'm going to grab the low poly car FBX this is the one that I just imported into the engine. And uh, I'm going to go have a look here at the back and it would appear that I am not missing a polygon in here. So again, I just want to make sure that uh, nothing is acting funny and that there's nothing bizarre going on here. I want to make sure that none of these polygons are facing the wrong way. I'm going to go double check where that is on my mesh. And just to go see. Now I've also got the uh, the car here. We modeled this in Maya, and we modeled modeled it incredibly small. And so I am going to need to go and scale this thing up. It's about the size of a uh, a child's plaything. This is not the size of an actual vehicle here. So again, I just want to kind of go and check at where this hole is. And it's a uh, it is a triangulated hole here as well. So what I might do is uh, I might open Substance Painter and export the FBX from there. So we're gonna do that. Only because I didn't see a hole while I was painting. Okay, while well, Substance Painter loads, let's go ahead and start creating material. To do this, I'm gonna right click, I'm in my materials folder, and I'm gonna head up and create a new material. I'm gonna name this MA. That, now that's short for master. And uh, this is a master material. Um, we are going to use this for all four of the different material elements that we've created. Um, so MA for master material. Now I'm going to use an underscore. If it lets me. And close this off. I'll try that again. There we are. And car. So this is the master material for my car. And if I double click on that, we uh, end up in the material editor here. So a little brief overview of the material editor. We have the preview sphere showing us what our material is going to look like. We have all of our inputs over here inside of the workspace. This is a node based workspace. So we'll be able to create a wealth of nodes here and drag them in. Um, and then we have our details down here. So anything that we currently have selected, we'll be able to change its properties. So the first thing that I'd like to do is bring textures in here. Now it doesn't matter which of the textures you bring in. And so I'm just going to choose the first three. These happen to be part of the Chrome. So I'm going to drag those in here. And now I have the three textures that make up the Chrome material. I'll let the engine catch up here so that I get a preview of what they look like. Now this one is pretty simple. This was our base color. So I'm going to wire that in. If you're looking at the five nodes here, the white one is the RGB values. So the red, green, and blue values combined. The red is for your red channel, the green is your green channel, and the blue is your blue channel. And then finally, the gray one at the bottom, this is for the alpha channel, which I, in our images, we're not using. So I can go and place the 
RGB values from our base color map into the base color slot. I'll grab the normal map and I'll place its RGB, RGB values into the normal map slot. And we should already start to get in our preview sphere here, once this finished loading, we should already start to see some of the values show up like we were getting in Painter. Now the last one is our combined map or our packed map. Now in here, Substance Painter used the A, A, O, R, and M format here. So this is A, O, or ambient occlusion in the red channel. R is our roughness, which goes in the green channel, and the blue was the metallic map. So here I can pull each of these individual channels into their perspective slots here. And then when this updates, we should get something that looks pretty close to what we were getting in Substance Painter. Speaking of Substance Painter, let's go take a look at our car. So I'm going to go and load up the car that I had worked on. Once this is loaded, like so, I'm just going to go to File. Let's double check to see if there actually is a hole. So there is no hole back here, so this is good. I'm just going to go to File and Export My Mesh. And uh, we're just going to go into the, uh, what's the OBJ format? So let's do that. I'm going to call it Car. And we'll do that. So I'm going to go back into the engine here. And uh, we're going to go back into Meshes. And I'll delete the FBX file that I imported. And I'll bring in the one that is simply called Car in here. So again, I'm getting some no smoothing group errors. I'm getting a wealth of materials here auto-generated, which I could have turned off. And then inside the car, uh, you're going to see that the FBX did not auto or the OBJ file um, has a little bit of an error to it here as well in that the car is sideways. And so this is uh, part of the difference between Y up and Z up here. So we're going to go and uh, and do some uh, changing to this thing here. So I'm going to go and re-import this again, car. Uh, and yes, I do want to re-import over it. Actually, let's delete this one. And let's go play with our properties here for import to make sure that the car is coming in the right way. Um, so again, I am combining my meshes, which is good. Um, I want to go to the transforms here on import. And um, we want to make sure that we are going to a Y up um, uh, setting here. Uh, so I'm going to rotate the car. And uh, we're going to do this on the, let's see, import rotation 90 degrees in X. And I'm going to scale this thing up a little bit too. I'm just going to scale it 5 and bring that in. And again, we get a warning. And we get the materials, which I forgot to turn off. But now our car is at least sitting on the ground. And I'm going to go double check that that hole is no longer present, which is indeed the case. Okay, car's in. Let's go back to our material editing. So, back in the material editor here, and uh, it would appear that in the process of re-importing and closing this window that I lost what I had been working on. So we're just going to go and re-bring these back in, and we'll do this again here from scratch. So I'll just go and wait for these things to update, and then we'll position them in the right positions here, and I'll just stack them in this order. And to begin with, we're going to start with the base color. And again, I'll wire in the normal map. And then again, our ambient occlusion, our roughness, and our metallic values. The next thing I need to do is compile this material or save it. I'll do the apply here. This will compile the changes. And then I'll hit save. And this is the, uh, the Chrome base here. So let's go take a look at how to apply material to a mesh. So if I head into my meshes and go into the car mesh, 
Um, we can see that there are the materials over here. They did bring the names in again, even though I deleted the materials. The names are still present. So I'm going to again go and type in Chrome here. The names are editable. Uh, if you don't like the name that you have on a particular material, you can go and rename it. Uh, you can hit the highlight button here. This is going to highlight where that material exists on your mesh. And we can also isolate it so we can see just that mesh alone. So here we go. I'm going to use the little drop down here and we can go pick our MA car. And now we can see what that looks like on the car. Well, it looks pretty cool. I can see the uh, chrome here on the door handle. And if I head over to the front bumper, I can see the uh, the black plasticky effect that we were getting there. I can see the uh, black shiny chrome rims that I placed and the uh, mirrors. I'm going to take a look inside the rear view mirror. And indeed, I'm getting reflectivity inside the rear view mirror. Okay, so there's our first material. I'll just save the car and we'll close this editor. Head back to the materials tab. Now, it is possible that you could just create four materials just like this. The problem here lies in performance. And what's going to happen is you're going to get a error or a, a slower loading game if you do this. Uh, each of these materials is going to require some loading time or some... Uh, uh, some time for the game engine to go and compile the code that runs that shader or that material. So one of the easy ways that we have here of kind of speeding up our performance is by just reusing the same material several times. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to make some changes to this, to this material so that it can be reused for other things. And those things are the textures. So here we have three textures, and we have these same three textures for each of our materials. These can't be changed on the fly. These are texture samples, and they're kind of baked into this material of sorts. And so what we're going to do is we're going to convert these into objects that can be edited on the fly. Those objects are called parameters. And so I'll grab my first texture sample here. This is our base color. And I'm going to go and convert it to a parameter. And we'll name that color or that parameter base color. I'll do the same for our packed map. Convert to parameter. I'll call it packed. And I'll do the same thing down here. Convert to parameter. And we'll go and name this one normals. Again, I'll compile this material and save it and close the editor. And uh, this should have zero effect on what's going on in this particular material. What I can do now is generate the other three materials that we need. To do that, I'm going to select my master material and I'm going to right click and create an instance of this material. I'll use the prefix of MI for material instance. Now, at a glance, this allows me to, inside of my content browser, be able to see which materials are master materials that will open the material editor and which materials are material instance materials that will open the material instance editor. This also, alphabetically, will keep all of the master materials together and all of the instances together. I'm going to put an underscore and I'm going to go and use one of the other material names that we created. Um, in this case, I'll call it paint. And I'll head into this material editor, and now you're going to see something a little bit different here. Instead of the node-based system that we have in the material editor, we now just have the, prop the properties of this material, which include the three parameters that we just created. Here, we can go back to our textures and grab the three next textures and just drag them into those slots to generate the next material. I'll head back into my materials and I'll create another instance. This one I'll call MA underscore rubber. Sorry, MI. This too is an instance. I'll enter the 
instance and turn on the parameters for edit. I'll head back into my textures and I'll find the rubber ones and I'll go drag them in, color, normal and packed. And then lastly, we'll make the glass. Create a material instance, MI for material instance and glass. And then in this one, again, we'll turn on our parameters. We'll go find the three glass textures that are here and we'll drag those in. Uh, I do believe I've made an error. <laughs> so we'll put these in here. Um, I just realized that in the paint, I use the glass materials and not the painted body ones. So we're going to have to go and edit that one again. I'll head back into my materials here. And indeed, I have two the same. So paint currently has the wrong ones. So I'll just go and swap these out. You can see this is pretty real time here as things move along. And now I can head back to my mesh and we can use the drop down menu here for each of these things. So here's the paint. We'll go in and grab the paint. This one is the glass and we can grab the glass. And the last one is the rubber. So if I go to check out my car inside of Unreal, it should look remarkably similar to the way it did inside of Substance Painter. I'm pretty pleased with the way that looks. Okay. With that done, I'm going to go and save all of the assets that I've done. I'm going to head to the base folder here, the content folder. And I'm going to hit save all and it's going to show me a list of all of the assets that I brought in and created as well as what type of asset they are. And I'll just hit save selected and each of those assets will now become part of my project. All right, the saving is done. Let's now create our little render scene here. So by default, inside of the engine, um, Unreal has gone and created this temporary little map or this startup map here, uh, which has got a skybox and a skylight here. This is the directional light. It's got a skylight rendering from the sky, a reflection capture object. This is gonna help make the reflections and our things look better. The player start, which we don't, actually even need and just like that I think we're good to go so I'm gonna to go to my meshes and I'll drag my car into the world and there it is in my details pane I'm gonna go and set this thing up a little bit here I'd like to ensure that I keep it at zero 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 this is again gonna help me when I create my turntable animation it's gonna help me ensure that the car stays in the middle of that render Excellent. I think that looks pretty decent. It might be a little on the small side. However, I'm going to leave it scale exactly as is. And remember that this is scaled up five times from when I originally imported it. It still looks a little bit small to me, which is fine. We're going to go and fix that. But before I fix it, I'd like to actually set up the camera system in the renderer so I can see how big I'd like it to be in the renderer. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to head over to my creation panel here. I'm going to switch over to the cinematic tab and I'm going to grab a camera rig rail. The camera rig rail is going to give me a track upon which we'll be placing a camera and the camera is going to go and follow the rail wherever it goes. So I'm going to go and place this at a place that is going to make sense to me here, which it's going to look a little something like this. I've got and put it at 0 in X, 400 in Y, and uh, 20 in Z. In fact, the Z here, we're going to bring that up again even further. Now, the position here is important. The way that I've got this positioned, 0 in X lines up with where the car is. 400, if this is going to be a point on our circle around which the camera will spin, that means that this 400 in Y is 400 units away from the car, meaning the radius of our circle is 400 units. 
I'm going to go and start moving the points on my spline in order to get them correct for a proper rotation. So here, we're going to go and find the position of this spline, which is at 100 in X, and we actually want it to be at 400 in X, and we'd like it to be at 400 in Y. Sorry, negative 400 in Y. Moving it 400 degrees in that direction, and 400 degrees in that direction. That is the second point in our rotation. I'm going to right click on my spline and create a duplicate spline point, which I can move out. This one is going to go to 0 in X, and it's going to go to negative 800 in Y. That should line it up with the back of the car. I'll right click and duplicate the spline point once again. This time, we're going to end up at negative 400 in X, moving 400 degrees or 400 units left of where we started, and negative 400 again, 400 units backwards in Y. And then lastly, duplicate the point a fourth time, which is going to end up right back here at the beginning. Now, I'm not going to place it right on top of this one just yet. The reason for that is that I want to rotate this point so we can make this box that we've made here look a little bit more circular. Right now, if we were to place a camera on here and let it animate, we're going to get a wobbly animation. So let's go and fix this up first. I'm going to change my angle snaps down to every five degrees, allowing me to rotate this thing to, on a 45. This one too, I'm going to rotate on a 45. And now that they've both been rotated, I can place them together. Okay. With that set, we can now start creating the rest of the circular arch that's supposed to be here. Okay. Now with these two points rotated, our tangents here, that's these red lines with the red boxes at the end, these are what are going to control how round this shape is. I'm going to head into my top view here in order to be able to see this in a little bit of an easier light. So the idea is here is to get this as round as we can, as round as possible. Now, if we don't get this perfectly round, the animation of our turntable, the actual camera spinning around the car, is going to pick up a wobble. You're going to get this kind of juddering that happens. And so the idea is to create as perfect a circle uh, here out of this spline as possible. Now, the math that goes around this uh, has to do with the radius. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a pretty um, interesting little formula here that you can get. The, the crux of it is that we are going to be using a percentage of the radius to determine where our tangent points or tangent handles should go. And uh, they are going to go at 55 or slightly over 50% of the radius of the circle. So our radius here is 400 units and we are going to have to get a percentage of those units so that we can use them and place these tangents in the right place. So what I'm going to do here, I just go on and copied out this value. So our circle is 400 units, um, and we are going to multiply that by this number here. So this number here that I've gone and copied, which needs a decimal point, is going to give us a, uh, a position for where this tangent handle should go. So we can see that 221 is about where it should go. Uh, this is a very uh, long decimal point here, and so the math is going to be a little inaccurate. Now, I probably should get the entirety of this number and place that in to where our tangent handles go. So I'm going to go into my arrive tangent, and this is going to be negative, and that value, and I'll hit enter, and I'll grab the uh, other value, and this is also going to be negative, and that value. And I can see right away that this is not having the intended effect that I wanted. 
uh, and that this is actually starting to curve this the wrong way. This is starting to make it look a little bit more square. Um, so I believe my calculations here are going to be off a little bit. Uh, let's go and do this here. I think the number I had that worked really well was 750 based off of a 400 radius circle. So I'm probably going to end up with a little bit of wallop here or warping inside of the circle. I can see here too that that is not nearly um, the shape that I'm looking to get. The tangents coming in and out of this point, uh, they look quite good, actually. This one really reads round to me. So I think what I might do is actually grab those. I'm going to just zero out the Y tangents here uh, because that does feel really round to me. And I'm just going to copy that number. And let's go and place that one in. So there's going to be a negative variant of that number and a negative variant here. And I'll do the same up here. These are both going to be negative as well. And then lastly, two positive versions in this one. And I'd say that's pretty close, but I don't think it's quite there either. Uh, I do believe that we're actually getting... A little narrower so one of the ways here that I can check my circle uh, is by grabbing the ground plane and turning on the rotation uh, this is going to give me the gizmo the widget here for rotating which is a perfect circle and I can go and see that I'm actually off here again um, in this case it's gotten a little closer but not yet there which means while this first angle did look pretty good uh, it's not actually what I wanted. So I'm going to bring this up to 600. I was at 7 before. So I'm going to bring these guys up to 600 and we'll see how well that works. So what I'm going to do here is just copy this 600 and uh, use that as a means of just pasting this back in. And that again seems to look a little bit better. And then a couple of positive values here. Now the amount of time you spend getting this to look like an absolute perfect circle um, is going to be up to you. I can see that I'm still off here uh, in terms of where this is uh, supposed to be. And so I might go and do 650. And I think I'll then call it close enough. So we'll just paste that in there and paste it in here. And again, negative values in here, negative values in here, and the last point is negative as well. So again, I'll just check and see how round that is. Again, not entirely perfect, but it's a little bit better. And in fact, I'm going to call it good enough. So there's now my rounded uh, spline, now tracing around the mesh of the car. Since what we're going to be doing here is a render, we should bring a camera in. I'm going to grab a cinematic camera actor, drag it in over here. And with a cinematic camera actor in our scene, we're going to get this little viewport here. This is a preview of what that camera sees. And once we've got that in our scene, we have all of the necessary elements here needed to start creating this video. So first, let's go and create a cinematics level sequence. And this is where, and we'll just save that right there. This is where we're going to be doing the, uh, the bulk of our animation work here. So the first thing that I need to add is a camera cut track. This is going to track which cameras are used when during the animation. We only have a single camera, so it's not going to be very hard to do that. I'm going to go and add a track here. A camera cut track is what I want. 
And in that camera cut track, we can use a little plus arrow here to add our cinematic camera actor. When that's done, we get a preview of what the animation is going to look like. I'm going to get rid of the negative space at the beginning here. And uh, I'm going to go and set the end point of this thing to 1200, like so. And we'll drag that red frame off to the end. So there, I now have a 40 second video that I'm going to do. And uh, we'll bring that cut track all the way to the end as well. Again, we'll go and bring this back and back and zero out the beginning. And there, we now have a 40 second animation. It is a uh, pretty boring animation. If I hit play um, and go and select my camera, there's nothing happening. Again, all the camera cut track did was just tell the engine which camera to render. And uh, with just that one in our scene, that's what it's rendering. So the next thing we want to do is tell the camera how to behave. And we're going to tell it to use this spline here uh, as intended. So in the cinema, cam cinema cinematic camera actor one, I'm going to add a track to that, which is going to be a path constraint. And we're going to bind it to our rail. Now, the camera snaps to the rail, and instead of being a very simple and static animation, we now have the beginnings of our turntable. The camera is spinning around the scene, like so. Now I am detecting some of that wobble, which means, again, I'm not entirely perfect in uh, the circle. Uh, and you can see this based off the center point of the car here. If I leave my cursor in the center of the point of the car, you can see as it approaches one of the vertices on this spline, the camera or the vehicle seems to shift away from the center point. So something like that. There's the center point there. Let's cancel the autosave here. So let's now and go make this. This has got some ease in and ease out on these frames, which we don't want to have so that our animation is loopable. So if I go and select my keyframe, I can go and right click and change it to linear. We'll do that with this one as well, linear. And uh, let's go and have another look at the animation. And it looks a little bit better now. Not bad. Again, the uh, the spine has got a little bit of wobble. It would definitely look better if it did not. Let's go and check this out in a full screen view here. Instead of this little tiny preview, I'm going to go to my viewport. We'll switch to the cinematic camera actor and we'll switch to the cinematic viewport. Like so. I'm also going to turn off the visibility of the rail since it obscures our view. Now if I hit play, we can see the animation in full tilt. Now, um... If I go and show you kind of where center is here, and I place my cursor in that spot, you can see the wobble generated from that spline not being absolutely perfect. Now, the wobble actually only seems to happen uh, at the very beginning. Once we've hit the, uh, the quarter mark, it actually seems to be okay. So I'm going to eject from there, and uh, we're going to go to the default viewport here. And I'm going to turn the spline back on, the rail. I'm going to select it. And I believe what's going on here with this thing is that it's actually the uh, the points that are in here. There are two points in here, the first and fourth. And so I'm just going to uh, separate them a little bit. Camera rig rail. Let's go into the spline components here. There we are. And I'm just going to separate the uh, the points so that I can go and double check that I have the same values, which I don't, which would explain the wobble. And I'll just go and replace those. So let's go check it out now. I'm going to go back to my cinematic viewport and back into my cinematic camera and we'll hide the rail again. And let's check it out now. And that's way better. It's still got a tiny little bit of wobble here, but uh, I don't think it's going to be as noticeable. 
Now, one of the things that I do find incredibly noticeable is how tiny my car is. It is occupying a very small amount of the frame here in our video, so that's not going to be good. Um, the second thing that I notice is just how much ground plane we have at the beginning here, and that's not good either. So the idea now is to go and do this in a much better way. So I want to scale my car up. I'm going to click on the camera and I'm going to pin the viewport here so I can actually see what the camera is going to look like uh, even when I select something else. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the properties of my car and we are going to scale this sucker up. So I'm going to lock its scale so that it gets a uniform scale. And uh, that's not going to work. I'm going to do something about three times. And I'm going to bring the rail up here. So let's try. I'm going to scale the car up a little bit further now. So that's not bad. I want to go and cycle through the animation. Yeah, that works. So my goal here is to make sure that the car never leaves any part of the render. Which I can see it spins around here, but it never actually leaves my window in any way. So those numbers are going to work really nice for me. With that all said and done, we need to adjust our lighting here. So lighting needs to be rebuilt. There are two unbuilt objects in the world. So I'm going to go and do that now. I'm going to go to build lighting. I'm going to go to my lighting quality and bring it up to production. And I'm going to do a build. Now, I'm not going to subject you guys to waiting and watching. And so I'm going to hit build. And I'm going to let this go. And when it is completed, I will resume the video. Okay, and just like that, the light bake is done. My little red error has gone away. The only thing I have left to do is now to export my animation, export my video. To do this, I'm going to go to the scene marker icon. I'm going to select that. And we're going to do this as a PNG sequence. I'm going to do this at 30 frames a second. And I'll do this at 1080p. Compression quality will crank that all the way up. And I'm going to turn off the cinematic engine scalability. The next thing I want to do is choose where to save this. So I'm going to go inside my stylized car folder. And I've got a movies folder in here, and I'm going to select that. Then I'll just hit capture movie. It's going to ask me to save my content, so I will. Then it's going to ask me to save my level, and I'll save it in the root. And then it's going to go to town. Now right out of the gate, I can see that there's an error, so I'm going to stop this. The error here is that I'm not anywhere where I should be. So I'm going to go into my cinematic camera actor and the cinematic viewport. And we'll do this again. So again, we are getting an error in the render. It is not using the camera. It says the object is missing. And it says the rail is missing. Okay, so this is a little bizarre. We're going to try and correct this here. So let's go and remove the track that's here. I'll delete the path constraint. And I'm going to delete the camera. And we'll just go and re-add those things back in again. So we'll add the cinematic camera. We'll add the path and bind to the camera rail. And there. Now my animation looks to be right again. So... I can just go back into my settings here and export again. It'll ask me to save everything. And now I get my proper render. So we're going to let this go. This does not capture real time. This is going to be a little bit slower. Um, as this goes, my folder in which I created this stuff, if I go and check out my project stylized car and movies folder, this should be populating with PNGs as it goes. Now, I can see that it did not overwrite some of the original PNGs that were there, which is a setting I should have turned on. So we're going to have to go and clear those. I'm going to actually stop the capture one last time. And we'll just grab everything and delete it. And then we'll go in here. There actually is a setting in here for overwriting 
previous files um, overwrite existing. I should have had that on to begin with. But there, we're going to go and do this again. So while this is capturing, if I go check out that folder, I can see it populating with images here. So I just want to double check. It looks like my animation is not working at the moment. And so I'm just going to go and double check that there actually is animation going. Oh yeah, it's going. I can see the car going. So just there were a lot of frames here going on. So what I'm going to do, uh, this is going and capturing. There are a lot of these files that need to be grabbed. Uh, again, I'm doing uh, 1240 seconds at 30 frames a second. So... Uh, this is going to have to create 1,200 files. I'm just about 10% of the way there. So again, I'm going to pause the video here and let this finish its uh, its work. And uh, when the render is back, we'll resume this and we'll uh, we'll kind of continue from there. All right, we're back. And now the video has completed its export process. If I head over to the folder that I've chosen for my exports, you'll see that I do have indeed 1,200 and in fact two. Um frames of my car spinning around um one of the things that i want to double check here is just looking at the very final frame of the car and the very first frame of the car and i just want to make sure that there is some motion going on there now one of the things i can also see here is that my car is blurry looking at it up close uh this is again probably something we should have looked at ahead of time but our camera has some depth of field in it and uh, that is causing the front part of our car to blur out, the portion incredibly close to the um, the camera here. And if I go and look at any of these renders from other views, you can see that just how blurry that is. So this is going to require, yet again, another pass on this. I'm going to go and delete these files again. Um, you can see that we are a couple of gigs in, in size here, so uh, it is definitely worth uh, deleting these things and uh, and getting this right so in order to get this right i need to select the camera cinematic camera actor here and uh the camera actor actually has a uh, host of settings on it that we want to go and take a look at um these are going to include things like the uh the camera settings the lens settings there's going to be some depth of field in here and that's actually what we're going to want to take a look at I'm going to do a search in here for depth. And I can see the depth of field here, and I'm going to make my viewport as large as I can in order to be able to see this. And we'll come back to that menu in a moment. And so uh, it's definitely worth going in and adjusting these things. Now, the other place where we can do this um, is to go and actually uh, keyframe them in the video. So here we have our cinematic camera actor. We have our path that this is following well we can go and add a uh, another track and inside of the track we can go and add some other components to the uh, to the the camera um and so that would be useful there as well um however it's probably easier just to go and set that camera up correctly um using the depth of field inside of its properties so let's go and do that i'm gonna go to its properties here and depth and uh, we're going to turn on the depth of field here. And uh, let's go into... Let's also go into our camera, current camera settings here. So look at tracking, relative offset, uh, allow roll, film back, uh, lens settings. This is what we want here. Let's see what this looks like with some of these other presets here so I think I'll leave it at a 30 millimeter uh, focal length and uh, the idea is that we can go and play around with some of these things again I want to get this kind of as big as I can here uh, the focus method uh, manual we're going to do tracking um, and we'll go and use the car as the means for tracking. 
We'll see how well that works. Uh, focus offset, current focal length, current aperture. So I'm going to go and play around with these here and find the one currently responsible. Let's set this to 35 millimeters. So I'm going to try and find. Here's our uh, our distance field here. I'm going to set this to manual again. Uh, and see what we need to do in order to be able to get those things. So let's do custom film. So I just want to go through the properties here and uh, and set this up in a way that uh, is going to allow me uh, to go and play with the focal distance. So I'm going to use the eyedropper here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the car. And what that'll do is it'll focus on the uh, on the car. Uh, this is going to allow me to uh, go and set this up here. Easy does it. Let's go and set this back to a 16 by 9 DSLR. There's the universal zoom. And I'm just going to make sure he's still in focus. And uh, we're going to double check this at a couple of different frames here. That indeed it is in focus. And that does look pretty good. I think the one last thing that I'd like to do, uh, just to try and make this look a little bit better, I've got a white car on a white background here. Uh, and I'm kind of losing a little bit of the silhouette of this thing. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to eject and get back into my default viewport. I'm going to grab my sun, and I'm just going to rotate this and do another build. This is going to uh, update my skybox to give me something a little bit more interesting. So instead of this blue sky with white clouds, I'll end up getting something that looks a little bit more like sunset here. So we'll let this continue building the lighting like so. I'm going to uh, enter game mode here, and we'll go back into our cinematic viewport and back into my cinematic camera actor. And there, that's got a lot more, I think, uh, you know, nice look to it than uh, than we were getting a moment ago. I dig it. That's pretty cool. The, uh, the last thing I'm going to do uh, in order to make this look, again, a little bit more professional head back to my content browser and back into my materials and I'm going to make just a one-off material here it's going to be another master and I'm going to name this ground and uh, I'm going to go and see if I can't do up a very quick asphalt type thing here um, just in order to give me something that looks a little bit a uh, little bit better on the ground now I've actually got some uh, some asphalt textures that I've done in the past um, that I might bring in here because they're going to uh, Again, just make this look pretty good. So I'm just currently browsing into a previous project and going to find the textures that I built for said project. Okay. So these were done quite some time ago, and as such, they're not... Uh, really using the PBR, physically based rendered style of texturing uh, that we get in uh, in the in the works nowadays. Um, and so I'm only going to have just a normal map and a base color here. Um, again, these were done for a, a former project or a previous project. And so I'm going to see if I can use them to help just speed up a little bit of a uh, asphalt looking texture here. So I only have a base color and a normal map, which I'll let this uh, generate a preview here. And we're going to see what that looks like. Now, these were built for a podium on a previous project. And so uh, there's going to be a area here where this is textured and an area where it is not. Uh, this also, you can see, does not tile, not very nicely. But uh, let's. I'm going to see if I can't use this as a starting point um, just to give this ground a little bit something else so I'm gonna go and select that floor and compile that material 
And then what I'll do is I'll just go and assign that material to the ground. There, my compile is done. So I'll just bring this up. And there's my ground. I'm going to go and drag it on here. And uh, we're going to see this is going to recompile my shaders. And I'm going to see what that looks like in the viewport here. Again, I'm in the cinematic viewport here. I'm locked into my camera. So this is going to give me the ability to uh, gauge what that looks like from here. Again, I'm not making a game with this. I'm not trying to uh, have a tiling, drivable set of streets. Um, and I can see it is indeed trying to tile here. So the UVs on this thing look to be a little bunk. Uh, I'm going to see if I can't figure out how many times this is tiling. It looks like one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. Let's try that again. I'm going to count half of them here. One, two, three, four, five. So it looks like it's tiling ten times. And so I'm going to go and add a texture coordinate node here. And we're going to try and see if we can undo the tiling on that plane rather than go and adjust its UVs. I'm just going to tile this a tenth. And we'll try and update that. And we'll see if we get a uh, better, higher... mapping ratio here than we were getting a moment ago. So I'll just go and save that material as well. And there, yeah, I think that's going to work. It's not uh, it's not the world's greatest texture. Um, I could probably use a little bit of shininess correction here. The roughness is going through the, uh, through the roof. But uh, at least it isn't just a flat looking material. So... I'm going to see what happens if I use the uh, the roughness here out of this guy. Again, I'm going to wait for my update here. And we'll go take a look at just how shiny that is. So it would appear that the red map is uh, pretty shiny. Let's try the green. I'd say that is pretty shiny too. So I think what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm just going to use this. And we're going to, uh, let's see, invert it. To invert it, we're going to use a 1 minus. And I'll plug that into the roughness. This is going to make anything that was black, or in this case of the asphalt, the pits, um, make them a little bit rougher. And anything that was lighter, like the surface of the asphalt, a little less so. Yeah, I think that's going to work. So again, I'm going to compile this material. We'll save it out. And again, while this is not a very high quality looking texture, um, it's at least something on the ground plane here. Uh, again, if I go and look at what this has done now to my render, that reads a little bit more like asphalt now. And so... I think I'm good. I think I'm finally happy with my render. And so, we are going to once again spit this out. Again, it's going to ask me to save everything that I've done. And as it goes, it's going to start rendering. Again, I'll uh, pause the video and when my render is complete, we'll come back. All right, and we're back. The videos have completed their rendering process, and this time I've got everything exactly the way I want it. I'm pleased with the outcome here, and the last thing that is required is just going to be to reassemble this into a video format. So I'm going to boot up Adobe After Effects. This is going to allow me to bring this render or this set of images inside the software and reassemble it into a video. Okay, here we go. 
with the software open, I'm just going to right click inside of the project folder and we're going to go and import file. I'm going to go and select the file here, the area where we saved out our content. This was in the movies folder. I'll grab just the very first one. The software will understand that this is a sequence and import them all together. I'm then going to right click on that newly imported set of images and we're going to create a new composition from this selection. This has now put this together in video form. So I can actually now see this rotating around. Now one of the things that I do want to double check here is that this is going to indeed um, loop the way that I want it to. And this is really, really, really slow animation. Um, at 40 seconds, uh, 40 frames a second is going to be pretty low. And so I just want to double check here. I'm just going to put a couple of these frames into RAM. And I'm just going to go check on the uh, the looping here. So again, um, I've got a uh, ease in and ease out problem. Uh, again, because I redid my path constraints, I did not redo my keyframes. And so that's going to be an issue. However, I'm going to leave it like this for now. And we're going to go ahead with exporting this thing. So I'm going to... Um, I'm going to go and spit this guy out. So I'm going to go to my render queue. Actually, I'm going to go to my composition and we are going to composition, add to render queue. In the render queue, we can go and set our settings here for export. So I'm going to go set this in essentially the same place we did it already. So I'm going to put this in my stylized car movies folder. I'm going to create a new folder here called final composition. Try and spell that right. And uh, we're going to save this in here. And I'll do a car turn table like so. And uh, that's it. I can go hit the render button. And the software will go and spit out the video format of my render. This looks like it's going to take about two minutes here in order to export this out. So again, I'm not going to subject you to uh, to seeing all of this. But the end result is going to be that uh, I have a now AVI file. Um, this is the end result of the renderers, is of the render, is uh, this AVI. This is going to be something that you can place on YouTube um, or in your portfolio or demo reel or what have you. And so there is a look at that. So uh, I hope this has been helpful and that this series has been uh, useful in your ability to go and create something like this. Um, I'm going to, uh, again, I'm not going to subject you to watching this render go. It's up to three minutes here. So we're going to end it there. And uh, I thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.